So Hebrews chapter uh, 9 and verse 8, we read this. It says, The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way unto the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing, uh, while the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings in carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. So he went through that information to tell you some lessons, the Holy Spirit signifying some things. The way wasn't, while this is standing, the way to God was not yet manifest. Uh, it could not make uh, those who did that service, their, their conscience pure. Uh, and they were just carnal ordinances till something else would come. And that something else is pointing all to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so then we're introduced to Jesus Christ in verse 11. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So now he begins the contrast. He leaves the worldly tabernacle, and he begins to talk about Jesus Christ and what he accomplished in the heavenly tabernacle, the true way to God. It says uh, that, verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. And, and so what Jesus Christ, when he points to Jesus Christ, we begin to find out he is the way to God, that he can purge your conscience from your sins. That is, he can purge your conscience and free your conscience once and for all that there is eternal redemption made for you. That you don't have to have a conscience of guilt, a conscience of sin, a conscience of condemnation, of damnation, but the, you, can be, you can have that purged your conscience can be purged from the things that these could not ever take away because his blood did secure eternal redemption for us. And it is him that can and did bring in uh, a reformation, which these carnal ordinances were, a time, were, were, were carnal and in it existing until the time of reformation. And Jesus Christ brought in that time of reformation. That's where we are in verse 15 as we bring in that time. Before I... Uh, there's one thing that, that, that I did want to bring to your attention because it was, it's something that I noticed and, and I think it's important for us to notice. Let's see where did I put that information. Verse 14 it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works? Now, that, that part we talked about pretty clearly last week as we realized that what he accomplished can give us the freedom to understand the, the, the liberty that we have in Christ, that is, liberated from sin, uh, to, to understand that he has done what verse 12 said, obtained eternal redemption for us. That his blood, he, when he died, he, had, he was eternal God, and through the eternal spirit, through his pure blood, was a complete, total payment for sin, so that we don't have to worry, our conscience don't have to condemn us, we can know that there is eternal life and forgiveness of sins before God. Now that's what he's expressing. But notice how it immediately ties into something that we're not used to doing. And that is this, it says, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And uh, we, don't, we don't often, especially because in the battle of grace and works, we so often separate salvation from service. Uh, and we do that for to maintain an understanding that you're not saved by your service, you're saved by faith, and then once you're saved, you are saved to serve. But we're always making that two different things. But you know, in the mind of God, and, and especially in the mind of a kingdom saint, you realize there, there, it goes hand in hand. Uh, but in the mind of God, I, I need you to understand that while we separate it for clarity of the gospel, it does go hand in hand. It's, there is not in the mind of God, I've saved you, now I want to teach you something else. I also want you to serve me. 
in God's mind is, I've saved you, you are my people, you will serve me. That's how it is. And, and we don't think that way. I, I, I would say that if our congregation, if Grace Bible Church would understand exactly who God is and the fact that he saves us and we belong to him, that, and that we are to glorify him in our body and our spirit which belong to him, that they would realize their service and there'd be more work done for the Lord in the assembly and there'd be more people attending Bible studies like Wednesday night service. But because we separate those two, they don't, they almost say, well, I'm saved. And all of a sudden the service for God isn't there like it should be in the Bible. Let me show you this. Romans chapter 14, uh, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter uh, 6. You, you have it here and it might just go unnoticed. But in Romans 6, verse 14, we're dealing with not allowing sin to reign in our bodies. And it's understanding our position in Christ that, that would, uh, would allow us to let grace reign instead of sin reign. But notice what it says. It says in verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Okay, so sin can't condemn us. It can't send us to hell because we're not under its reign. We're under the reign of grace. That's salvation, acceptance with God. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. See, there is in Paul's mind an understanding, and, and, it, and it's really, if you understand it from a Jewish culture, culture, maybe you'd understand it better. And that is, God does not use, God will not use, unclean vessels for his service. So that... If a person is unsaved, they're lost. They've never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They have no value to the service of God whatsoever. And as much as some people want to be used of God, they're, they're trashed concerning as, as God is concerned. They're an unclean vessel. They're not fit for his use. And he will not use them. But what Paul is expressing here is that by us being saved by the cross of Christ, we have been finally made usable to God. For the first time in our life, we can actually serve God because being cleansed from our sins frees us from sins that we might become the servants of righteousness. That's for the first time in our life. So that with our salvation comes the wonderful thought that now I can actually be useful to the Lord. Now I can serve the Lord. Now my service would be accepted by Him. And, and, and there is no separation here, as, you're, as, as I've said at the beginning, between salvation and service. This salvation means now I'm fit to serve. Hallelujah. Not like, okay, well, I'm saved, and I'll think about serving him someday. No, the, the, the idea of salvation is so that you can serve him. Uh, and, and that's the emphasis that, that you're getting here. Verse 19 says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmities of, the, of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, to iniquity, unto iniquity, even now yield your members as servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. That is, God didn't, God didn't hold you accountable to do righteous things because you belong to sin anyhow. You were under the reign of sin. So you're free from righteousness. Go ahead and sin. But, but verse 21 says, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin, ye became servants to God. Ye, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So, there's, so we ought to understand that salvation allows us now to serve God. And that, see, in Hebrews, look at Hebrews chapter 9. That, that's, that's the natural blend here in verse 14. Uh, again, the last part of that verse, it says... Um, well, verse 14 says, uh, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve? Now, purge your conscience from dead works is to understand that this can't save you, but what Jesus Christ did can save you, and it purges your conscience. And now that your conscience is free, you're no longer under the guilt and penalty and condemnation of sin, what are you free for? 
<laughs> purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And, uh, and, and that, that ought to be the natural fruit of salvation, is realizing now I belong to him, now I can serve him. Uh, sin has been dealt with, and now I can become his servant. Now that's clear in this fashion. We've been talking about the tabernacle. Do you think that an unclean priest could ever serve in that tabernacle? <laughs> they always understood that. They, that's why that laver is out here before you even get into the inner part of the, the tabernacle. These priests had to be cleansed. They had to wash their hands and their feet even before they go into this section. And then no one dared go into this section without carrying some blood. Otherwise, he's going to drop dead as soon as he walks behind that curtain. No priest ever served God unclean. But he would go through a ceremony, those cardinal ordinances, to pure himself so that he could be of a service to God. And so now that Jesus Christ has provided the way for us to be purged of our sins, we're purged of our sins so that we can serve the living and true God. We're clean so that now our service is acceptable to God, free to serve God. And, and in, in the Jewish mind, that's real clear that that's what the purpose is. It takes the Gentiles, who the Bible calls sinners, to, in order to maintain the understanding of grace, is to separate salvation and service, which I do all the time. But at the same time, people will catch on to the salvation part, the service part, well, that's... <laughs> That someday I'll get around to serving him. I'll someday, I'll just take advantage of his salvation. Not understanding you're saved to serve. And in God's sight, it's not two different things. He did this for this. He bought you with a price. Therefore, glorify him. And, uh, and we separate that. And, and I, I understand why we do it. But I understand the, that in the, in the Gentile mind, we're just prone to the flesh. And uh, not prone to zealous service of God. Like someone who Paul, a Jew, even when he was unsaved, even when he was lost, he was zealous for God. Except his service wasn't acceptable with God. Now, it's acceptable with God. So anyhow, you see that tied in in Hebrews. I thought, when I read that verse, so often that works part to serve, my, my instinct wants to separate that. And so I had to think about how that is one blend of a sentence there in verse 14. But go back to Hebrews 9 now, and beginning in verse 15... Just like over here, these priests had a divine service, so Jesus Christ had a divine service. Let's read about his service. Not just in the tabernacle in the sense of taking care of our sins, but it begins in verse 15 saying this, Hebrews 9.15. It says, For this cause he is the mediator of a new testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that was under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now, you know that phrase called? It was when God, Jesus Christ was dealing with the nation of Israel that he said, many are called, but few are chosen. Who did God call to be his servants? Israel. Who did he choose to be his servants? No, more than that. The believing remnant. He called the whole nation... But it's only the believing remnant are his elect. And in, the, in that sense, when you start reading here, it talks about uh, uh, which he might receive. Uh, he's the mediator of a New Testament that they which also uh, are called might receive the promise of e eternal inheritance. Uh, he has invited them to become something, a part of something eternal. But, but what we're getting into here is Jesus Christ is divine service. He talks about what he did as opposed to what was being done under the tabernacle. What Jesus Christ did in the presence of God to deal with sin for us, that he has become the mediator of something new. And this is a, an important part of the book of Hebrews, especially the next couple chapters now, is that he is the mediator of a new testament. Now a testament has to do with a contract. And there was a contract that God made with the nation of Israel and, and we call it's being called an Old Testament, according to Hebrews 8.13, where we already read, in that a new covenant he hath made the first old. There is an old covenant, and that is what God gave to Moses to the nation of Israel is being replaced now by a new covenant, and Jesus Christ is the mediator of that new covenant. And, and he is the mediator of a new covenant, a mediator standing between here the nation of Israel who is sinful and holy God, Moses stands in between and gives the law, but the law can't make him holy. Jesus Christ steps in between, and with his new covenant of his blood, he can make this nation holy and make them of use to God. 
And, and, and so by, it was by means of death, it says, for, for, and for this cause, he is the mediator of a new testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that was under the first testament. Now, that's just basically saying that all those who were under Mosaic covenant, did any of them fulfill it? <laughs> no, the Mo Mosaic covenant left them all condemned. So that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he didn't just die for, for the nation of Israel in his day and future Israel, but he died even for those that were under the Mosaic covenant and had failed. His blood is the blood. It, what the writer of Hebrews is doing here is exactly what Paul says in Romans 3.25, where it talks about that God sent him Christ forth to be the propitiation uh, for the sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. And he's not talking about your past sins and then your present sins and your future sins. When Jesus Christ died, he died for the sins of all mankind for all time. He, di he died, and it was his blood that actually paid for the sins of the Old Testament saints. That is, the Old Testament saints who believed in God and did the things that God said. You're going to read here that the blood of bulls and goats could never take away their sin. Look at chapter 10, verse 4. It says, for, the, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Now, all, all it did was allow God to forbear, to hold them in a place that, that God said, I will save you, I'll deal with your sin, you've done the proper thing in offering the blood of bulls and goats, and you've come to me in an acceptable manner, and, and I'll, just, I'll just hold on to that as a down payment until the real payment comes in and takes care of that. And when Jesus Christ died, what, what chapter 9 and verse 15 is saying, it says, for this cause he is the mediator of a new covenant, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that were under the transgressions, that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. All the believing remnant of Israel might receive the internal inheritance by Jesus Christ and by the means that he is a mediator of a new testament. Now, verse 10 says this. It says, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Now, you know, when I'm looking at this, I've always had a problem here. And that is, when I understand verse, uh, verse 16, I should say. Uh, when, I, when I look at verse 16, and it talks about there must also be the death of a testator, I understand that in terms of our society, and that if my, if my children want to be a recipient of their inheritance, they are my heirs, but they don't get anything until I die. So we think of it like of a last will and testament. Uh, and yet at the same time, the testament that's being talked about here is a testament of, uh, a, testament of a contract between God and, and his people. And in the Old Testament, God didn't have to die to give the Old Testament, those, the, the people under the Old Covenant, that contract. But it did require blood. And what it is with them, there has to be, there has to be the death of a testator but in, under the Mosaic Covenant, it didn't have to be God who died to establish the Old Testament. He had a substitute die for him. Under Moses, they took and they, they sacrificed some animals, and, and that death of that animal became the means that would ratify that contract. We sign a contract. They ratified it in blood, and that's the, what the death of the testator is. There has to be blood shed to provide the means of that covenant to be into effect. Uh, but in the New Covenant test, case, it took the blood of Jesus Christ to ratify that new covenant and to bring that covenant into effect. So it says in verse 17, it says, for a testament is not a force after men are, oh, thank you, okay, <laughs> for a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength all the while the testator liveth. And there is, the, the, the new covenant was promised way back by Jeremiah in chapter 31, and it stood there as something that God was always going to give Israel, but he never gave it to her. She, she couldn't have it until the blood of that testament was shed. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ said before he died, the day before he died, when they had the communion together. And he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Now, from what you're reading there, the, where it says, uh, uh, for a testament is not a force... After men, or, why do I keep putting the knot in there? For a testament is of, of, 
force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. If that's true, when Jesus Christ the earth walked the earth during Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and was ministering to the nation of Israel, was he ministering under the new covenant? Now, this, this is a, an amazing thing because most people have never thought about that. It, it's there, but it has no effect. So there is no new covenant until after Jesus Christ died on the cross. That's where Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all end. So therefore, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not the new covenant. And when, you're, when you turn your Bible to the New Testament, if I would say to you, open your Bible to the first book of the New Testament, you ought to immediately go to the book of Acts. Because that's the first time the New Testament has any effect on anybody in this earth. And that's when the Holy Spirit came to the nation of Israel, which is part of the new covenant promise. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus Christ came and he lived and died under the law. And it's the shedding of his blood was for the effect of establishing the new covenant. But even here in the book of Hebrews, he's just now teaching that the blood, uh, that the blood shed by Jesus Christ is so that the new covenant can go into effect. It won't even fully go into effect till Christ comes back. And, uh, and so the New Testament doesn't begin till the book of Acts. If, watch this other part, verse, verse 19. It says, uh, verse 18, it says, Where, Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of, of calves and of goats with water and, scar and scarlet wool and hyssop, and, and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. That's after it was finally built. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. So what, what he points out is there, the, the testament can't go into effect until the blood has been shed and then applied. And, and so now he's saying that that is true of the first testament. So if I would ask you to turn to the Old Testament and to the first chapter of the Old Testament, what chapter would you turn to? Made it a little harder. I didn't say what book, did I? Okay. Well, you're getting pretty close. The book of Exodus is the book that you would find the Old Testament beginning at. But there was no shed blood in Exodus 19 or 20. You know when Moses did what this verse is describing? Pardon? No, no, it's, it's in Exodus. It's 24, if I remember. I didn't check this. I just believe I know it. <laughs> you can check it and see if that's where he did, did it or not. It's, he, he, in Exodus 24, he's done telling them all the precepts of the law, and then he had the young men do the sacrifice, and then he sprinkled everything. He sprinkled the law and the people and said the, that, you're, that you're under this covenant. That happened in Exodus 24. So if, if, the, if the law doesn't go into effect until the blood is, is, is there, is shed, is, is uh, sprinkled, uh, then, then the old covenant did not begin until Exodus 24. And... Uh, and, and that's an amazing thought to some people because they think the Old Covenant, uh, the Old Testament is Genesis and the New Testament is Matthew, and, and that's just not it. That There's a general way in which we do that, and we, we sometimes say it by accommodation, but the actual fact is, is the Old Testament began in Exodus 24 and ran all the way through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The New Testament began with the book of Acts, got interrupted by the age of grace, and will, be will fully come into effect at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and so you have Acts through Revelation as part of the, as part of the New Covenant. Uh, so so th those are important to know. But the point is, is that a covenant can't come into effect until there is the shedding of blood. Until there's, excuse me, until there's death. And then verse 22 said this. It says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. Now, we've been talking about having our conscience purged from, from dead works, purged from the guilt and condemnation of the law, and, 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 and the law, not, nothing was ever purged, no sin was ever dealt with, except that blood was, was uh, sacrificed or shed. 
as a, as a means for forgiveness of sins. And so not only did it take death of the testator to bring in a New Testament, it takes blood in order to bring in forgiveness of sins. And, uh, and that's the importance of verse 22. And that's the, that's the service, the divine service of the Lord Jesus Christ. He did that. Now, do you remember last week I told you about John MacArthur writing an article where he says blood really isn't that important, that it's the death? Do you remember that? I don't know if that's significant to you or not. I told you it was to me, and I wish that I could find something on it. Well, I have John MacArthur's uh, commentary on the book of Hebrews. And I thought to myself, you know what? I bet you he was teaching the book of Hebrews when those articles went out. So I looked up this chapter and what he said about blood. And I have it for you right from the horse's mouth. <laughs> Listen to some of these things about this. Here's what he's writing. Again, why he's writing these things, you can speculate. But listen to what he says, and I'm, I'm going to jump in and out of his commentary. He said, It is possible to become morbid about Christ's sacrificial death and preoccupied with his suffering and shedding of blood. It is especially possible to become uh, unbiblical, unbiblically preoccupied with the physical aspects of his death. It is not Jesus' physical blood that saves us. But, uh, but his dying on our behalf, which is symbolic by the shedding of his physical blood. If we could be saved by blood without death, the animals would have been bled, not killed, and it would have been uh, the same with Jesus. And by the way, someone came up to me that last week and said, well, if, if it was just his blood, he could have just cut himself and shed some blood. Well, it's not... It's not just shedding some blood. He did have to die for our sins. That's the penalty for sin. But if the life of the flesh is in the blood, he had to shed the blood because that is the shedding of his life. That is bringing about death. But, but it, it's not that a few sprinkles of blood is going to accomplish the payment for sin either. He had to shed his blood and die. But, but to say that the blood is only symbolic... When, the, when we got these verses, like in verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Redemption has to do with a payment. And what paid for our sins is his blood. When it, in the Old Testament, in Leviticus 17, when the blood was said, God said, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar for an atonement for sin. What pays for our sin is the blood. And Jesus Christ had blood, both not only did he have the, the eternal spirit where he's eternal God, but he had physical blood so that he could die for physical mankind. And his blood was not a sinful nature. His blood was a pure blood. A pure life was shed for the payment of our sins. And it took his blood to pay for our sins. Without the shedding of blood is no remission of sins. It didn't say without death is no remission of sins. It said, without the shedding of blood is no remission. Why a man would write these things and, and try to get away from the bloody details uh, of the cross. Let's listen to some other things he says. The purpose of the blood was to symbolize sacrifice for sin, which brought cleansing from sin. Therefore, without shedding of blood is no forgiveness. Uh, there is no forgiveness. Again, however, we need to keep in mind that the blood was a symbol. If Christ's own physical blood in itself does not cleanse from sin, how much less did the physical blood of animals? Now, what a statement. It didn't say it did. It said it did, but he said it didn't. It says, uh, Is it not surprising then that the old covenant allowed a, sim a, sim a symbol for a symbol? He goes on to explain. A Jew who was too poor to bring a small animal for, for a sacrifice was allowed to bring one-tenth of an ephod, about two quarts, of fine flour instead. And he quotes Leviticus 5.11. His sins were covered just as surely as those of the person who could afford to offer a lamb or a goat or turtle dove or pigeon. Uh, this exception is clear proof that the old cleansing was symbolic just as the animal blood symbolized Christ's true atoning blood so that so the ephod of, of four of, of, of flour symbolized uh, the uh, represented symbolized and represented the uh, the animal blood this non-blood offering for sin was acceptable 
because the old sacrifice was entirely symbolic anyway. So what he's trying to say here is because God allowed him to bring some flour, because if they couldn't afford a turtle dove and, and a, they could bring a flour and, and offer a sin offering uh, by a, some measures of flour, and, and therefore God, if he used that instead of blood, then its blood really wasn't that important to God. Now, that's what he's saying. Go back to Hebrews 9 and look at verse 7. Now, you tell me <laughs> if his argument is going to hold up. 9 verse 7 says, But into the second, and he's talking about in the Old Testament, he's dealing just like MacArthur is here, and he's talking about this priest who was allowed to go in to make an atonement for sin. It says, But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood. Now, God might have made provisions for a poor man to bring some flour, but when it comes to the nation of Israel and their atonement for God, this priest didn't say, well, blood's not really that important with God. I got a cup, couple quarts of flour here, and I'm going to go into the second part of the veil, and I'm going to sprinkle this flour on the mercy seat of God and see if he'll accept that. <laughs> he wouldn't dare do that. <laughs> There's no way that you're going to go into the presence of God with flour. You don't go in without blood, and you don't go in until you've been cleansed before you go in. And uh, for MacArthur to use that illustration that God made a, a place uh, uh, for poor people to say that blood really isn't that important is dangerous. He says, since the penalty for sin is death, nothing but death sim uh, symbolized by the shedding of blood can uh, atone for sin. So what he's doing every time he talks about blood, he's just saying blood is a symbol of death. And that's what's important, death, not blood. Let me finish this first. It says, the only way we can enter into God's presence... The only way we can uh, participate in the new covenant uh, is through the atoning death of Jesus Christ made effective for us when we trust in him as saving Lord. There's no such thing as atoning death. <laughs> there is no such thing as atoning. I have that underlined. It's his atoning blood. It's his blood that God said he gave an atonement for sin. He's actually changing and twisting scripture because he doesn't like the gory details of blood and, uh, and, and just trying to make death more important than blood. But you, you don't read these verses, all that sacrifice, all the things. If you would read the Old Testament and, and just visualize the sacrifices that were going on, it was a bloody mess. It must smell like a slaughterhouse around that temple all the time. Because blood is important to God. That's why Hebrews 9 verse 22 was saying, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. So Jesus Christ could not pay for your sins by getting run over by a chariot. He'd get himself killed, right. Go ahead. Well, that's my whole point. <laughs> when he dropped dead, <laughs> there, there is no substitute on the Day of Atonement. And, uh, and, the, and, and what we're dealing with here is Jesus Christ making an eternal atonement, eternal redemption for us. And his blood's not important? Well, if it was important there, how much more is it important here? That's what, in fact, that's the wording of verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot unto God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? If that was important, how much more his? And then he writes a commentary on Hebrews talking about how it's not important. Boy, it's dangerous. Well, there is. I mean, you know, he, he died for our sins. Exactly. Yeah, that's not... He couldn't just bleed. He had to die. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. No, he had to bring the blood. Exactly. I handed out to the elders in the last elders meeting. Uh, there is within the gray circle some real troubling things that are going on. And that has to do with some people that are saying that even though you're saved by grace, you have to confess your sins in order to be forgiven with God. And... Uh, and, and they, most of them who do that, do that on 1 John 1, 9, where it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
But that's, John is saying that to the nation of Israel who has rejected Jesus Christ. He says, he says to them, if we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar. But if we'll admit that we've sinned, if we confess our sin, he'll be faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Our is the nation of Israel who has yet to acknowledge that they've killed their Savior. And if they'll acknowledge that they killed him, God, when they confess their sins, he'll be faithful and just to forgive them of their sins. Now, that's not what I wanted. I, Art Sims, tell him not to dig too much on my desk there, will you? What, what, what they say is you've got to ask God to forgive you, that you might be forgiven, uh, you, might have, you might be justified from your sins, and so you'll have eternal life. But if you've done some things wrong in the day, you have a broken relationship with God, and until you confess that sin to God, there is, a, there is a, a problem between you and God. And you need to be forgiven. Pardon? He's aware of it, but what they're saying, unless you ask for forgiveness, there is a broken relationship. Turn over with me to, uh, uh, to Colossians chapter 1. I spent hours digging that article out. Because Art Sims is a guy that we would recognize as someone uh, that, that, that someone generally would write things that would uh, build us up in the faith. But he was so upset with the fact that people could just rest in grace and not confess their sins, and that 1 John 1.9 wasn't for us, that he wrote an article, and the basis of his article is, is that there's a difference between being justified and forgiven. And that justification it has to do with your salvation, but forgiveness has to do with your relationship. And why you can be justified from all of your sins, that doesn't mean you're forgiven of all your sins, because forgiveness is not a ju judicial act of God. Now, that is the most absurd thing I have ever heard. The reason why is, well, y do you still have Hebrews 9, or did you already go to Colossians? If you're in Colossians, let me, let me read first to you Hebrews 9, where we've just read in verse 12, where it says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal, now catch this phrase, redemption for us. Now it's his blood that brings about redemption, that is, the payment of our sins. Then, then in Hebrews 9.22 we read this, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. So the writer of Hebrews is acknowledging that the redemption, the payment for our sins, is the same thing as remission of sins. That both are, I mean, when you go before a court, and, and, and God is judging something there, if there is a payment made, for the evil act that you did, then you can be forgiven of the crime. If, yes, if that payment has not been paid, then justice demands that you pay it no forgiveness. So that's exactly what you're reading here in Colossians. In Colossians, and, and to separate those things is ridiculous because the Bible always puts it together. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14, it speaks about Jesus Christ dying for us, and then it says in verse Colossians 1.14, in whom, that is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, then it says, even the forgiveness of sins. Now that, I, I, I've learned to do this, and that phrase, that even, means over here you got redemption through his blood. Even means which equals, like this, brings this about. Because of this, this is, is the result. And, and so there, there, it's like an equation that this equals that. So that we have redemption, the payment for our sins, which is his blood, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. They're one in the same. If there was no redemption for our sins, there would be no forgiveness. But because there has been redemption, we have forgiveness. How long does his redemption last? So how long does your forgiveness last? They're equal. And for someone to separate the two, listen, if God 
if, if there's somehow that God has not forgiven you for one of your sins, sorry to say, you don't have a pure conscience. <laughs> your conscience isn't pur purged, and you better shake in your boots because the way to God is not yet manifest. Now, the very, the very understanding of the blood of Jesus Christ is that not only has there been a payment for sin, it's been so complete that there is forgiveness, total forgiveness of all of our sins. And when you sin, you ought to be ashamed of it, and you ought to repent of it, and you ought to thank God that he's forgiven you for it. But to think that you're not forgiven until you ask him for it, how many, we sin so frequently, you'd never cover everything on the list. You think you remember every sin you did today? I don't think so. I think you'd put it out of your mind so fast, and if you left one unacknowledged and there's one sin between you and God, there's eternal damnation for you. But uh, Paul, in his grace, emphasizes so often about our, our redemption and our forgiveness uh, based on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, and so does the writer of the book of Hebrews. Well, we won't finish chapter 9 today. <laughs> but it's okay because chapter 9 is going to blend. It's going to, it's going to be the setting to go into chapter 10, which if anybody was excited about us studying the book of Hebrews before we started, it was because they know that the information in chapter 10 is so wonderful uh, that that's why anyone would like to study the book of Hebrews. Some of the other stuff's too hard, <laughs> but chapter 10 is a, a real blessing. Yeah. That redemption is, is not a, he says that forgiveness is not a judicial act of God, that it's a relationship with God, that justification has to do with God dealing with sin Ju judicially and forgiveness has to do with relationship and therefore they're not one and the same they don't equal each other and you can be justified but not forgiven yeah now I'll find the article somewhere <laughs> took me hours to find it once it'll take me another couple hours to find out where I put it <laughs> I thought I had it with me <laughs> oh yeah oh Dave. yes yes yeah okay let's pray our God and our Father, we thank you that we could study your Bible. And, uh, Father, as we take the time of not only studying it, but realize some misstatements, some men that, that could be respected, and in some areas are very respected, um, that they're just men. And uh, when they make statements contrary to your word and, and, and diminish what Jesus Christ has done from us on the cross, we pray that we might not give place to those statements at all, that we might expose the error so that we might rejoice in the full, complete payment that Christ made on the cross and rejoice in what we have in Christ and, uh, and just be able to take our stand in grace and realize that we are accepted. Father, we do pray that more and more our minds might be purged from such carnality to think that you've saved us and you bought us with the price of your Son and that that means that somehow we can live the rest of our life the way we want to, or even in sin. Father, may it be deep into our soul that we might realize that we've been freed from sin, that we might be your servant. So we thank you for our study today, and pray it will pray be on our heart always. In the Savior's name we ask it. Amen.